everyone, it's Aya Sibira. I'm joining you all from lockdown in Sydney. Um, my suburb, Smithfield, in Fairfield, is a COVID hotspot as I am recording this. Um, unfortunately, the video on my computer clonked out, so you don't get a chance to see my COVID hair. I have not shaved since the beginning of lockdown. Um, so it's probably all for the best that we're doing this via audio and not video. Um, so I just wanted um, to introduce myself briefly, as I have been requested to do so by Prem. I spent the last five years at Newbury Buddhist Monastery. So um, I know MBM quite well. It's very dear to my heart. Ajahn Brahm was... Um, the officiating monk teacher at my bhikkhuni ordination. So I've also been very blessed, um, you know, to have Ajahn Ram in that important role in my life. Ajahn Ram is a meditation master and a teacher of teachers. My own personal experiences of Ajahn are mostly involve um, telling bad jokes during meditation interview which I'm not going to repeat um, just because they were that bad. But I'm sure you all, um, you all know that about Arjan already because one of the amazing things about Arjan is that, um, you know, Arjan can be both of those things. He can be, um, you know, really someone who's done um, so much for the global spread of Buddhism and you know, such an accomplished teacher and someone who's very down-to-earth and relatable at the same time. So um, it's a very auspicious occasion to be able to send 70th birthday wishes to Ajahn. So I'm actually currently staying at the Metterama which is a bhikkhuni monastery in Western Sydney associated with the Metta Centre. Um, you know, the monastery name, um, it's a bit of a, <laughs> bit of a challenge to live up to, but, you know, it's, sometimes these things are aspirational. So I'm at the Metta Rama, supported by the Metta Centre, and today I'm going to be sharing a little bit of metta meditation. So I think I have about 25 minutes total actually to talk about metta meditation, which is good because it's enough time to actually, you know, to really sink our teeth into it a little. When I first started learning Buddhism, um, one of the things I did was I began attending my local Thai temple, my local Damayut temple, um, you know, just an urban temple within the Thai forest tradition. And that was okay. Um, I got a lot out of that. I learned breathing meditation. You know, at temple itself, breathing meditation was mostly just something we did for five minutes after chanting. That I was lucky in that I went to a very practicing temple and, you know, that we were encouraged to meditate a lot at home, you know, to come in and observe um, the moon days, the one Fridays. So, like for me, medi breathing meditation was something I kind of related to. It was something I understood um, relatively intuitively. You know, around that time, though, I, I never heard anyone actually talking about metta meditation. And I realize um, in retrospect, you know, maybe that was a gap um, in that particular teaching tradition. Because I recall a particular monk teacher from Thailand saying, you know, that monks don't actually need to focus on metta meditation. Because, you know, as a forest monk, you have enough metta already. So the whole concept of actually of um, taking up metta as a meditation subject was something I came to relatively late um, in my own meditation story. 
um, again, you know, met the meditation really just being something you do for uh, maybe five minutes at the end um, of, you know, a chanting or another meditation session. So for a long time, really, that was how I understood metta meditation, you know, as a nice add-on you do when you're doing something else. Um, but I mean, there are people who do have metta meditation as their primary meditation focus. One of them, of course, being my own teacher, um, Bhante Sujato, who has been advising um, on the Metta Rama Monastery Project. So um, I was fortunate to be able to attend a retreat by Bhante Sujato in Queensland, where I did get more time to learn his particular way of teaching metta meditation according to Ajahn Mahachachai's instructions. So I did all of that, and I was still I was still a little bit confused about what precisely this whole metta meditation thing is meant to be, and it took me. Um, a long time to actually get my head around it and to figure it out and you know they say there are two types of teachers you know one's the type of teacher that gets the subject straight away the other is the type of teacher that has to really muddle through things and because you know they have so many problems you know that process of just encountering problems has, has been how they've learned the subject so I think when it comes to medita meditation um, you know Maybe it's the case that I've just had so many problems with it that um, that's why I've really finally come to a kind of decent understanding of what its purpose is meant to be. Um, so I think for me, the thing that finally um, helped me to understand metta meditation um, was more actually of a conceptual shift. Um, for example, we see in the Metta Sahagata Sutta, in the Sangyuta Nikaya, that metta meditation is something that needs to be practiced on the basis of having eliminated um, or suppressed the five hindrances. So as you know, you're all students of Ajahn Brahm, you've all been meditating, you should know what the five hindrances are already. Um, the sense desire, the ill will, the sloth and torpor, the restlessness and, restlessness and remorse and doubt. So those things which block us from breathing meditation are also the same things which block us from metta meditation. So metta meditation itself, you know, it's exactly the same as breathing meditation. We eliminate the five hindrances and we cultivate the awakening factors or the bhajangas. So knowing that was really actually the conceptual shift that helped me to understand um, what's actually going on with this whole metta meditation business. Um, and after, you know, after realizing that, that's when I began to appreciate that you know, if you can do breathing meditation, you can do metta meditation as well. They're not like completely things that are alien from each other. So when we do breathing meditation, um, you know, we come from a point where our mind's confused to a point where our mind's more peaceful. And when we do metta meditation, it's exactly the same thing. And one of the things about the metta sahagata sutta, you know, it's this very comprehensive account of um, what metta meditation can actually lead to in Buddhism. Because you know, all of these people from different religions, they were saying, hey, Buddha, you know, we teach metta meditation too. You know, what you've been telling your disciples, um, it's not any different to what we've been doing already. And that was when the Buddha had a chance to explain that actually, you know, the way, the way that I'm teaching it as a targeter, you know, the scope of it is a lot more um, complete than anything you've been talking about because you know there's a nice um, there's a nice paragraph at the end of the Metta Sahagata Sutta you know which states what the apex or what the culmination or really the end goal is 
of mental development through metta meditation. And that end goal being um, this kind of mental pliability where we feel what we, we want to feel. You know, so we're not um, we're not perpetually trapped uh, in these kind of rigid or ossified reactions um, to the um, perceptual world. And you know, even if we uh, choose to feel nothing at all, you know, that's also one of the potential outcomes of. Um, development through metta meditation so you know metta meditation is something we can take all the way through to the aruba jhanas according to the metta sahagata sutta um, so it's not artificially limited um, in terms of what the outcomes can be it's just like breathing meditation or anything else so that's the profound scope of metta meditation in buddhism And so, you know, what are we actually doing um, when we do metta meditation? So according to the way I was taught by Bhante Sujato, um, when we do metta meditation, we use words of metta to bring up the feeling of metta. And according to Ajahn Mahachachai's uh, method, you know, that feeling of metta is something that's um, anchored in the body and you know we can actually um, continue to perceive the the body as well while we're doing this um, recollection of the words of metta because you know the the point is the feeling you know this soft warm gentle friendly feeling of metta and not necessarily um, the words themselves. The words are just the prompt. So we take that, um, you know, that warm, that loving and expansing, expansive feeling of metta, and you know, we eliminate the five hindrances. And as a result of the purification of our minds through the elimination of the five hindrances. Um, what happens is that the mental and perceptual and emotional aspects um, of that experience will naturally become more prominent. And when we have this purely um, perceptual and emotional experience, um, that's what's called the nimitta. So it's a perceptual experience in the sense that we might experience it as light. Um, and it's an emotional experience in that, you know, there's the emotional experience of, um, of the piti sukha um, associated with that. Um, in particular for med meditation, there might be, you know, a particular emotional tone of expansiveness or love. And, you know, maybe even the perceptual aspects are influenced by the topic of metta as well. So maybe, um, you know, depending on the way our perception um, perceives these things, we might perceive some, um, you know, very indescribable colours um, that, you know, maybe um, we associate with the experience of, of love. So, yeah, basically, there's, um, you know, the fundamental aims of metta meditation are things we should be familiar with already um, from breathing meditation, which is a huge bonus. So metta meditation does not actually require any fundamentally separate set of skills from breathing meditation. And I think that's um, why Ajahn Brahm had spoken about, you know, you can actually just combine metta meditation and the breath. And, you know, you can have very beautiful um, meditation experiences that way. So I mentioned um, previously that what are we doing? We're calming the five hindrances. We're cultivating the seven awakening factors. So what are those seven awakening factors? You know, in Pali, they're um, sati, dhammavichya, virya, piti, pasadi, samadhi, upekka. I hope I got all of them. Um, so sati being mindfulness, dhammavichya being investigation of states, so investigation of wholesome and unwholesome states, virya being energy, 
Kiti uh, being rapture, Visadhi being um, tranquility of body, Samadhi being reunification of mind, and Vipekka being, you know, one in this feeling. So we come into the metta meditation through that gateway of sati, of mindfulness, and the Buddha said, you know, some of these um, bhajangas, some of these awakening factors um, are, are energizing, some of them are calm, but sati is always helpful. So no matter what, we always come into meditation through this gate of sati or mindfulness. Um, and, you know, the next bhajanga, the next awakening factor, um, being the investigation of states or the discrimination of states, the dhammavichya. So we can see, we know as Buddhists that there's such thing as the wholesome and the unwholesome. We know that metta is the wholesome and, you know, whatever ill will or negativity we had previously, that's the unwholesome. So if we can reflect like that, if we can reflect on the benefits of metta, um, you know, we don't really need to push our mind um, <laughs> too too hard, you know, to make the good choice, to make the choice of metta. So that's um, tamavichya. And, you know, once we have that kind of um, cognitive or even, you know, emotional, this kind of effective understanding, then we naturally, we get a little bit of um, oomph, we get the virya, we get the energy, um, we get energized um, because we're abandoning those unwholesome states. So we get the wholesome energy um, and, you know, once our minds brighten up, we get joy. You know, and that joy leads to calmness of body and mind. We get both the chitta basadi and the kaya basadi, and you know it's that basadi that really um, gives us that kind of flexibility to be able to sit for long periods of time because we're just happy and our bodies have calmed down and our minds have calmed down, and you know there's no place in the world we'd rather be. So, you know it's that basadi that. Um, Yeah, that um, calmness, which in turn leads to samadhi, which is the um, unification. So our mind's um, not going all over the place. It's just content and happy um, to stick with this topic of, uh, of metta meditation. You know, if, um, if it's perceiving the metta nimitta, it's, it's happy. It's not, we're not looking for anything else. We're not grabbing the meditation object and saying, you know, you have to stay here with me forever. We're okay. We're not. We're not possessive about the meditation. It's just. It's stable in and of itself. Um, and that samadhi, um, you know, that in turn leads to pekka, um, to the eventual cultivation of, um, you know, of beautiful neutral feeling. And we can, if that's the way we choose to do things. Metta meditation can be taken through until fourth jhana, um, which is. Um, you know, which has that purified neutral feeling, or um, as the metta sahagata sort of states, it can be taken further um, into feeling nothing at all into the uh, arupa jhanas. So metta meditation can be your primary meditation uh, theme, and you, you can take it the whole way as, you know, as your sole vehicle for, um, for meditation cultivation, if that's what you choose to do so. So I think I've talked enough about the hindrances and the bhajangas. Um, sorry, I said bhajangas, but I should have said awakening factors about the hindrances and the awakening factors for now. So what we're going to be doing for the next 20 minutes is just spending some time, um, you know, gently and mindfully cultivating the feeling of metta. So... Um, bringing to mind all of those warm, positive feelings of friendliness that we might have. And we can use the words of metta to help to bring up that feeling. And, you know, with the, um, with the remainder of our attention, if we choose to do so, we can continue, um, you know, to watch our breath, just breathing in and out mindfully. So we'll do that for the next uh, 20 minutes, just watching our breath as we breathe 
in and out mindfully with our eyes gently closed. Breathing in. May all beings be happy and well. And breathing out. May all beings be happy and well. So we can continue to do that. Paying attention to the feeling of metta that goes with the words of metta while continuing to breathe for the next 20 minutes.
that concludes the meditation. You can bring your attention That concludes the meditation. You can bring your attention back to the room and to the sounds around you. You can relax your hands 
and slowly, gently and mindfully open your eyes. So what we're going to do now is to use all of that radiant and lovely energy of metta that we have accumulated and to wish long life and good health to all of our spiritual teachers. We're going to wish long life and good health to Ajahn Brahm in particular on this auspicious occasion of his 70th birthday, um, wishing that he can have many years ahead of him to continue to practice and to teach Buddhism. So I'm going to um, just spend a little time silently so we can all just really focus on that wish from the sincere depths of our hearts So before we wrap up, we can just spend a little time reflecting on the practice session we've just completed. We discussed abandoning the hindrances and we made an effort to abandon the hindrances during metta meditation, which is very wholesome. So um, we should take the time to remind ourselves that what we are doing is wholesome, it's good, metta is good. Um, you know, it was probably um, enjoyable. Um, so if you did get, um, you know, some happiness out of it, you know, you can spend some time reflecting that, you know, metta meditation is good. When I do metta, I feel happy. And we can also um, reflect a little that this type of happiness is completely wholesome. You know, you can have as much of this type of happiness as you want, and that's okay. Um, it's good for you, it's good for everyone, and if you do enough of it, you know, it'll lead to nibbana. So um, we can reflect that way as well. And just to wrap up, we can finally reflect that, you know, this metta meditation that we completed um, it's wholesome, it's enjoyable, and it's also impermanent. So it doesn't belong to me, it's not mine, it's not a self. Um, we've completed it, it's finished now, and we can let it go. So that concludes um, my sharing for today. Um, it's been Aya Suvira from Metharama in Sydney. Um, please do feel free um, you know, to visit any time. Um, if you want more information about Metarama, you can just Google Metarama Sydney. And I look forward um, to seeing many of you around sometime. So see you all. Bye.